Hello and welcome to Motor Week. This week on the programme, it's a clutch of coupes and cabriolets. First up, the drop tops, Ginny Buckley in the really rather sophisticated Honda S2000, a little two-seater roadster for the new millennium. And I'll be trying very hard and failing to look cool and sophisticated in the rather larger four-seater drop top Swede that is the Saab 93 cabriolet. And the coupes, well, this is the Seat Leon, and it's something we will be looking at in future editions of the programme. But to get us in the mood, Chris Goffey tries out first of of all the Astra Coupe, a car that some have said is well, a bit boring, others have said it's just rather grown up, and he'll be pitching that against the Citroen that got Claudia Schiefer's kit off, remember? The Zara Coupe, a car that some have accused of just being a marketing exercise, but we'll find out. There are some things in life that are just downright annoying. People that turn up late, burnt toast, running out of toilet paper, and the fact that the Honda S2000 is a listless lump of metal until you hit 7,000 RPM. The Honda S2000 is an interesting proposition simply because it redlines at 9,000 RPM, which sounds an absolute hoot in theory, but in practice has its drawbacks. You see, there aren't too many roads in our country that lets you fully appreciate the wonderful six-speed gearbox or really get the most out of the naturally aspirated engine that pumps out 237 brake horsepower and can hit 60 in just under six seconds. And that's such a shame. You see, at law-abiding speeds, the Honda's engine feels motorcycle-like. Below 7,000 RPM, it actually feels, well, not unlike an MX-5. Those thrills that it promises really don't materialise. And while the engine does sound fantastic, it seems a pity that Honda's engineers haven't paid closer attention to the chassis and the steering. You can't put a finger on any particular fault. It's just that the whole dynamic performance leaves you a little wanting and wondering exactly what could have been. The first thing you notice about the interior is this Formula One style instrument panel that goes up to 9,000 revs. Apart from that, it's really a very Spartan affair in here. But that's okay because it means nothing gets in the way of the driving, which is what this car is all about. These snazzy red seats hold you in nice and tight. And there's a good deep seating position that makes you feel as if you're in a cockpit. That's enhanced by the high sides to the doors, the steering wheel, and this lovely little button that helps you start the engine. The hood is triggered by the flick of a button and six seconds is all it takes to raise or drop. Perfect for our British summertime. The S2000 was born out of the SSM concept that was unveiled at the 95 Tokyo Motor Show and it's truly stunning with its long bonnet and sharp line styling. A fitting birthday present from Honda to itself. The thing about a great sports car is that it should turn you on the minute you climb aboard and get better from that point on, whatever speed you might be doing. And the problem with the S2000 is that you have to thrash it well beyond the speed limit to truly appreciate what it's capable of. And at £28,500, it seems like an awful lot of money just to lose your licence. Dreams. We all have them. We all have to have them. Something to keep us going when things get really tough. And it might be anything. It might be a villa in Tuscany, a bar full of custard and a night in with Naomi Campbell. It might be a little two-seater drop-top sports car. But if we've got a family, there are certain problems with nearly all of those dreams. You're not going to fit a family in a two-seater car. There are alternatives, cars like BMW's 3 Series or the Audi A4 drop-top. And then there's this, the Scandinavian Warrior, that is the Saab 93 convertible. Now, you might think it's a bit weird that a country hardly renowned for its balmy weather produces convertibles, but think about it. For half the year, OK, it's dark and the sun don't shine, but for the other half of the year, the sun doesn't go down. And you wouldn't want to miss any of that lovely sunlight, would you? It's typical Saab, because as soon as you sit in here, the first thing you'll do, if you've not driven one before, is... It, there's no keel. It's not there. It's down here, behind the gear lever, where it locks the gear lever into reverse so that you can't take it out, which is a security feature, because if you were to nick it, you'd only be able to drive it backwards. 
not much use, which might also explain why all Saabs have just about zero rear visibility. It's a security feature. It's supposed to be like that. Saab love their turbos. They'll stick them on anything and everything. Estate cars, saloon cars, pencil sharpeners, toasters. They've all got one, and this is no exception. You even get a little dial to tell you whether the turbo's spinning up to speed. But don't expect any kind of old-fashioned whoosh, because there isn't any. It's a light-pressure turbo. So the good side of that is you don't get any lag either. You're not sitting here waiting for the acceleration. It feels like a pretty powerful but normally aspirated engine. Chopping the top off a car might mean that you get the wind in your hair, you can tan as you commute and really impressive girls, OK? Uh, but it seldom does anything at all to improve the drive and handling of a car. In fact, in the Saab 9.3, you get a huge amount of scuttle shake, which I always thought was a dance James Brown might shout out in one of his songs. Scuttle shake. But what it means is the whole of the front of the car twists and rocks because we've lost the rigidity of the roof. Then again, it's not, and never has been, a performance car. Actually, once you've got past the scuttle shake, the body control is really very good. It doesn't rock and roll as much as you think it might, and it is quite an entertaining drive. There's still quite a lot of power going through those front wheels, so it will scrabble for grip from time to time. And there is actually still a little bit of a whoosh from the turbo when you get it right. This is all well and good. It's very nice, in fact. But it doesn't happen very often. We've had to wait 16 and a half weeks to get a sunny day to film it like this. This is how you'll spend most of your time. Roof, very definitely, up. Good, now we can head off for some fun in the drizzle. Much more like it. The high waistline, low roof line and limited area of glass does mean that when you've got the top up, well, it does feel rather cosy inside, possibly even gloomy. Then again, you are incredibly well protected from the elements. On motorways, you'd be quite forgiven for thinking this is actually a hard top, and Saab are very proud of that fact. Rear accommodation for passengers is limited, as you'd expect. It's rather narrow, thanks to all the gubbins to drive the powered hood. And it is rather short. You do lose some, and you do lose quite a lot of boot space as a result of the storage area for that soft top once it's down. With its curved aircraft-style cockpit, it does feel very, very solid. No doubt about it, Saabs do last for hundreds of thousands of miles, and I suspect this will do the same, which is quite unusual in any convertible. It doesn't have a flimsy feel to it. Far from it. Ultimately, any four-seater sports car is going to be a bit of a compromise. It's not as nimble or, let's face it, as stylish as a two-seater roadster. Neither does it have the carrying capacity and the rigidity of its tin-top relative. There is a certain glamour to it, though, but at between 25 and 36 and a half thousand pounds for the top vegan version, you will be paying for that glamour. So for most of us, it must remain in the field of dreams. Back where we started then, with the villa in Tuscany and the bath full of custard and a night in Naomi Campbell. Hey, impossible dreams. Mind you, I could probably afford the bath full of custard. You know, it's got 180 brake horsepower and it would outpace a Porsche 944. But that's enough on the Seat Leon, because more on that in a week or two. After the break, though, Chris Goffey on the Astra Coupe and the Zara Coupe. Now, normally, if you ask me to choose between a Vauxhall and a Citroen, well, I wouldn't hesitate. The very name Citroen conjures up Gallic charm, engineering eccentricity, soft suspension, the sort of car to waft across the French countryside. Vauxhall, well, they come from Luton, don't they? Reps cars. The words excitement and eccentricity just don't exist in the General Motors phrasebook. But things are rarely as they seem, because this is not a proper Citroen. It's straight out of the Peugeot Citroen PSA parts bin. The Zara is a sister car to the Peugeot 306, and this, the Zara Coupe, is really a three-door hatchback version of the Zara Saloon. So let's see what the Citroen has to offer. Well, it's light, and with the two-litre, 16-valve engine developing 167 brake horsepower, you don't need to be a mathematical genius to work out it's going to be quick. Zara feels much more like a three-door hatchback than it does an out-and-out -out sporting coupe. Nevertheless, 
It's very quick on the road. It feels very nimble and it responds to steering input immediately. The interior feels very similar to the Zara Saloon. Seats are quite supportive and comfortable, though I have to say the choice of fabric design isn't my cup of tea. What both these cars are trying to do is capture the elusive British coupe market. Why is it elusive? Well, because no one's yet cracked the success that the venerable old Capri enjoyed in its heyday. Probe certainly failed to do it. Cougar isn't making a huge impact. Vauxhall, however, are trying to recreate their Calibra success with the new Astra Coupe. Will it work? Let's find out. At first glance, things don't look too good. We all know the Calibra was merely a restyled Cavalier, but at least it had that style. Astra Coupe makes even less pretense about being different from the saloon version at the front. It's pure Astra, it borrows the boot lid from the saloon, and at least in side profile things get a bit better, but despite the Bertone badge on the side, nothing can disguise the fact that this isn't one of the master's greatest hits. On the road, it attracts very little interest, even from other Astra owners. And I think that's a mistake. Coupe owners like to think they've got style. It's not as though Vauxhall don't have the ideas either, because their new VX sports car really does look exciting. What this version of the coupe does share with the sports car is a new all aluminium Vauxhall engine. 2.2 litres, it's called the Ecotech, and it develops a, a relatively modest 144 brake horsepower, which really isn't that impressive when you consider that 10 years ago they were getting 150 brake out of the old 2 litre GTE Astra. What's gone wrong? The interior is pretty bland, it's very much Astra, though this binnacle up here for computer and uh, in-car entertainment and navigation is a neat touch. Nice comfortable red leather seats and for a coupe, a fair amount of room in the back. The old Calibra was, well, sleek and that's exactly what the Astra Coupe is not. So despite my prejudice about Peugeot badge engineering, I've got to say the Zara looks more fun from this duo. As you can see, I've got on my very best clothes. I've got the stately home to match. And the reason for this move up market in my image is this, the Bentley Arnage red label the latest thoroughbred in a long line of classics from Bentley, one of the most famous car names in the world. And this is just awesome to my eyes. Bentley is still one of the few cars that remains instantly recognizable all over the world. And in recent years, it's definitely outshone its famous stable mate Rolls Royce. One look at the Bentley red label tells you why. This car has got class with a capital C. From the impossible to ignore grill, to its elegant rear end. What I like about the Bentley is, unlike its famous stablemate, the Rolls Royce, it's got a much wider appeal. Everybody from pop stars, Hollywood legends, obviously the rich, but even lottery winners all go for the Bentley. It's got something different. But the thing that I really like about it is that beneath the distinguished exterior, this wonderfully lavish interior is something rather special, and it's this. Turn the key and blip the accelerator, and the sound hints at the awesome power of the Red Label's 6.7-litre turbocharged V8. The thing about the red label is that it turns you into a real Jekyll and Hyde type of character. One minute you're going along silently, serenely, and then the next minute 
by pressing this small button here, you have liftoff. It's a little bit like Houston, we have liftoff. I'm talking 0 to 60 miles an hour in under six seconds and a limited top speed of 155, which is pretty impressive for a car that weighs nearly two ton. The Bentley, it's got stiffened suspension, a stiffened body shell, and it gives it an amazing agility for a car that's just under 18 foot long and just over six foot wide. The way it handles really does take some believing at times. Bentley, of course, is now owned by Volkswagen. Yes, I know, yet another German company with a big hold on a British company. But in fairness, they've invested over 500 million in a range of new models, including the new red label. And I think they've made a damn good job of it. In fact, this car goes to prove that the best of British and the best of German can work very well together to produce a really good car. It's also crammed full of the latest technology, hidden discreetly behind a traditional forest of wood and a herd of cows worth of leather seats. Oh, I almost forgot the price. It actually seems rather vulgar to mention it, but it is actually a very modest £149,000. And that, in supercar terms, is pretty close to a bargain. Unfortunately, those very nice people from Bentley now want the keys back, and that means I'm off to get the bus. Oh, isn't it gorgeous? Just look at it. Brand new today. The way the, the circle is just, you know, well, round and the, the points, they, they meet the edges perfectly there. It's even got a little, a little stick here. And it kind of wobbles on its little stick. It's just beautiful. Oh, and you get, um, you get one of these as well. Car. It is, in fact, the new Mercedes C-Class. And whereas its bigger brother, the S-Class, which this does look suspiciously like, is more likely to find itself living in a place with a drive well, rather like this one, the C-Class is one strictly for suburbia. Traditionally, Mercedes have not been aimed at the likes of me. I get bored of anything within six months, cars, three months. Mercedes are traditionally aimed at people who keep them for millennia. In fact, Mercedes are delighted to say that they've got about 3,000 orders already taken for this car before it goes on sale and before the people who are buying it have even seen it. That's because they've always bought Mercedes and they always will buy Mercedes, whatever they're like. You could put Mercedes on your old Coke can and sell it. Now, I know it's still the budget end of the Mercedes range, but there is something very comforting about knowing that you're sitting in a car that is no bigger than a Mondeo and actually needn't cost that much more than a top-end one, but it's better built than your house and will probably be around a lot longer. It's actually longer than the previous C-Class, but because of its shape, it looks smaller, more compact, and that is translated in the drive. Whilst not exactly feeling tiny, it does feel a lot more nimble than the outgoing model. And it is a vaguely sporting experience. I say vaguely because, well, don't expect it to romp away madly. Easy choice of engines. This is the 200, which means it gets a two litre with a supercharger and about 163 brake horsepower. That translates, if you're interested in figures, to 0 to 60 in 9.3 seconds, which is quite respectable. The 180 has a two litre engine, and then it all gets a bit confusing because there's a 2.6 in the 230, the 3.2 litre V6 in the 320, 
Who cares? You're not going to remember them anyway. This is the kind of mid-range, probably one of the better sellers. And it does feel pretty strong, but it is still a Mercedes, so Sir and Modem are asked to restrain from anything that's too verging on the hooliganery. Another refreshing change comes in the fact that standard specification will be slightly higher than has been traditional with older Mercedes, where even wheel nuts would have cost you extra. You'll even find a six-speed manual gearbox as standard. Or you can opt for the five-speed automatic that we've got in our test car, which is, well, a little on the slushy side. Mercedes say, though, that they've answered critics of their previous manual gearboxes and their six-speeder is a lot sharper. That coupe-esque silhouette has another advantage apart from looking good. It does mean that it doesn't create as much drag, which of course in turn brings benefits in fuel consumption. Mercedes, in making their changes for the new C-Class, have dumped the old round dials, and we've got this kind of half-moon affair with a needle that cranks its way around the speedo set firmly in the middle. You wouldn't want to know about anything as vulgar as revs, after all. And I'm not sure. I don't like it. I prefer round dials but that's just me. This is a crucial car for Mercedes. It's their big seller. They expect to sell thousands upon thousands of these. There's no word from Mercedes yet on prices, but expect it to be competitive. They're keeping quiet as of now, I suspect because they don't want BMW to turn around and knock a couple of hundred quid off every model and claim to be cheaper. It will sell. No doubt about it, just the three-pointed star on the front would see to that, but the difference is this is a C-Class that you might just find desirable and not just the Tweedy set. Whereas the old one was very much a hyacinth bouquet to BMW's slinky Claudia Schiffer 3 Series, this new C-Class hits back with a naughty little Anna Corner Cova. It looks a lot better and is a lot faster too. Watch out BMW. On next week's programme, a Porsche, a Mercedes, an Alfa Romeo, and a Skoda. See you then.